as you enter in, just worship with us here. We're just lifting up the name of the Lord here. Hallelujah, King of kings and Lord of lords, we come before you. We bow before you this morning. Bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My Lord makes its, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see, church, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you saints. For those who fear him have no lack. The young lion suffers want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears, ears towards their cry, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their trouble. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Oh, that message is for today. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. You don't have to do anything if you believe in the Lord saying the Lord is near the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will lay the wicked, will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The last verse here of Psalm 34, the Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Thank you, Lord God. And we worship you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. By reading that, we can know that our Redeemer lives. Our Redeemer lives. Hallelujah. Claire, my redeemer lives.
take my name Well, love is my redeemer And he's lifting me up from the ground And love is the power Where my freedom song Let's sing that again
because of his love. So when you're thinking about that song, to me it's not only just singing about the eternal, the grave, the grave part when you leave here, but it's talking about things in our lives that need to go. They need to go. They have no place in a child of God. And they creep in, and we know who does that. But we know the hope. We know the love. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Dwell on his love right now. Just dwell on his love. Think about his love. What does the love mean? What does the love of Jesus mean to you? We can try to say it. We can try to tell it. But what does the love of God mean to you on the inner man, inner woman that you are?
Thank you. 
just going to keep playing for a few more minutes. And uh, yeah, don't slow down back there, guys. Don't slow down. We're not like a lot of churches where we got a checklist or an agenda. We got to get from this thing to that thing to the next thing. When God is doing something, we want to pause and we want to wait on Him and let God work and move. And so I would encourage you not to be impatient this morning and to just sit and meditate upon the Lord to seek His face. You know, they uh, sang a song that said, I'm desperate for you. Desperate for you. A lot of people will say, how can you sing a song like that about, about God? Well, if you've tasted and you've seen that the Lord is good. It's like creme brulee. If you've never had it, you can't understand. But if you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, all of a sudden it's the only thing you want. So let's just wait on him a little longer. Dan, keep on going. and mercy's all in heaven. It's the Care Bears up there. I grew up with the Care Bears and the Care Bears are dumping the buckets. Grace, love, mercy, it's all waiting. It is all waiting to be poured upon you. You don't have to do a thing. You just got to stand there like when the rain comes. You just stand there. You let it apply to your life. You accept the rain. You accept the grace. Accept his grace this morning. Accept his love. Whatever he's pouring out. The Care Bears are pouring it out. A little smile, think about him. What do you need? We're all individuals, you know. We can't move from a place when God is trying to minister so uniquely with each one of us. He's so good. He's so good. Hallelujah. Grace has found me just as I 
Amen. 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 Praise God. You know what's fun to do? And you don't do it very often in church, but sometimes you just need to. And that's just shout. Can you give him a shout of praise this morning? Hallelujah. Glory to God. You're so good. Lord. Hallelujah. Lift your voice, church. Lift your voice. Hallelujah. Glory be to the name of the King. Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise Him. Amen. Mel, why don't you come on up here? You guys can be seated if you'd like to be. We're going to transition and get the kids downstairs in just a minute. In just a minute. I saw them. They all just like, boom. <laughs> Mentioned kids and they were, oof. I don't even have a mic for you. Uh, Levi, you got a mic? I can't give you my headset. Well, it might be more than a minute. That's <laughs> all right. That's all right. When they hand me the mic, I walk away from the pastor. I know. I can't grab it. <laughs> it's dangerous. <laughs> no, let's do, uh, stay in the attitude of worship right now. Um, I'm going to just pray in tongues for a second here to direct mm -hmm. me because I'm loaded. So yes. <laughs> I, I only want to let go of what God wants me to let go. Amen. Lord, we come in the name of Jesus. We thank you. Shakana Masi, that is Sanda, Korias, Korea Mosio, Isa Namakoria, see, the Manassi, Masadi Amakoria Masi. Well, in the middle of that, the Lord says, You haven't seen nothing yet. Amen. Amen. Um, testimony. Uh, God's so good. I mean, it's, it's been a long ride for about a year and a half. And um, it's been good. No complaints. Amen. Um, but back uh, about a year ago, a year and a half, I was diagnosed with stage four uh, prostate cancer, which nobody gets <laughs> except me. <laughs> no. <laughs> but anyway, I had a prostate removal back in January 2020. Then all of a sudden, my. Uh, my uh, PSA just started shooting up again, which shouldn't be doing when you don't have a prostate, because <laughs> that's what produces it. So it went up, went up all the way to, uh, I think it was like six or something like that. It's supposed to be zero dot zero zero one. <laughs> so they they said, "Well, the radiologist, ah, oh, let's just radiate you and, and do that." I said, "Well, why don't we find out where it is first? You know, well, I know where it is. I said, well, they gave me a PET scan. It wasn't where he thought it was. It was in my lung, on my lung. So I had that removed. So through three CAT scans, one bone scan, one, two PET scans, uh, one MRI, two chest x-rays, um, they, they looked at the last, I had a PET scan Wednesday, Tuesday. And they looked at it. And the doctor called me that night. <laughs> That's how quick it was. He said, they can't find no cancer in you. <laughs> See, there's a process we go through sometimes. And if you don't focus right, you start blaming God. God had nothing to do with it. I had everything to do with it. You know, I opened the doors, and the enemy came in. So when you open the door, the enemy comes in. I'm, I'm, he's not, he doesn't ask. He just comes. He's not friendly. He's ugly. And uh, so what do you do? You pray. You know, you pray the blessings of God over the situation, and you ask the Holy Spirit, what is it in me that I need to do? You know, we're always begging God to do something. God, move. God, do this. God, do that. Do, do, do that. 
Hey, make a song of that. <laughs> da da da. <laughs> but anyway, that's just just me. <laughs> yeah. You focus, and the Holy Spirit will tell you exactly what you need to do. Yeah. Amen. Not man. Man can help. I'm not saying they don't help. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they help. But I tell you what, you better listen to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Because it's your life you're working on. Yeah. Amen. You got to know his voice. Yeah. I tell you, it's, it's awesome. His voice is awesome. You know, I need a word from God. I need a word from God. You know, so a lot of people say, I want a word. I want a word. I got a word. Read your Bible. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Come on. And listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to his word. Yeah. Not what somebody's telling you. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I've seen this. I've been saved for over 40 years, so I'm not a new, newbie. But I've seen most prophecies that were prophesied to people. Probably 20% was God, 80% was man. It's truth. Yeah. So eat the hay and spit out the sticks. Come on. <laughs> Amen. Listen to what the word is saying. You know, you'll justify it with the word. Don't let pride come in. I tell you, pride, you know, I'm this, I'm that, I'm so, so holy. I seen the so holies. They're gone. They're gone. Their lives fall apart. Because what they're doing, they're doing the same thing Satan did. They're building themselves up on somebody else's word or somebody else's doctrine, and they're putting themselves higher than they should be. Amen. See, when God looks at us, he looks this way. Yeah. There's no, none greater. None greater. Let me get down there. There we go. There we go. You know, we're, we're all yeah. part of the body. Amen. And listen to his voice. I, I could just, just tell you this. I, I was with my sister the other day. It's her birthday today, actually. Um, my sister. Yeah, my daughter. <laughs> I was with my sister, too. But, hey, oh, yeah, actually, I was with my sister. I'm sorry. I get those two mixed up. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I call them one each. Oh, boy, that's another thing. We won't go down that road. <laughs> Pastor's going to say, my message is getting slower. <laughs> Today, I'm going to cut we, you off here soon, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's good. Amen. So I was my sister. It was her, her birthday. Or is it next month? But anyway, she says, I saw something at a, a, a thrift shop. And it was like a, a cassette player. I mean, a real to real player. I said, oh, I used to have one of those in Vietnam 50 years ago. And uh, she said, I got it. She said, it's in, it's in my basement. So I picked it up, brought it home. And uh, I had a bunch of tapes from Vietnam, you know, the old rock and roll stuff. You know, <laughs> the green, green grass of home. <laughs> <laughs> All these songs that made you want to go home. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not Melvin here. So I listen to the tapes and I get it which it works and all of a sudden I hear goo goo ga 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 yeah. You know, baby, a baby talking. Forty years ago, it was my daughter. And I knew her voice. Yeah. I didn't remember doing it, recording it, but I knew it was her. Hmm. See? And that's why I'm saying that, because that's why you have to know the Holy Spirit, the voice of the Spirit. Because hmm. there's many voices out there. Too many voices. Amen. No, way too many voices. Yeah. Preach. Yeah. This is the sure word of prophecy right here. Amen. And don't go from one side to the other. I've seen guys get involved in somebody's book, in that book, I mean, some, what he said was good and excellent, but eventually scary. it drifted off. Yeah. Jimmy Jones, I don't know who remember Jimmy Jones. 
That's way back. He started out here. And he got a congregation in, in California, a big congregation. And pride came in. Then he thought he was the Messiah. Yeah. Then he brings all these people down to South America and feed them the magic Kool-Aid. He killed all of them. I do like Kool-Aid. Well, not that kind. Not that kind. <laughs> Amen. Anyway, I'm sorry. I love you. I can't get the mic too close to your mic, though. Yeah. Go. yeah. <laughs> but this, well, this is a message of how to hold on. Yeah. You know, the enemy's going, he's going to try to kill you, to kill, steal, destroy, and mislead you, misguide you, misdirect you, whatever, what, to whatever, media or whatever. There's so much junk out there. Yeah. So much. Even under the covering of the Spirit of God. Mm. We need to know. Yeah, amen. That, that's my bottom line. I had to know what to do. Mm. My radiologist called me. Oh, we got to do it. We got we to gotta radiate you. I said, well, can't you find the spot and just go to the spot? And this was his words. And this is what changed my mind. He said, well, you got to burn the barn to kill the fly. You got to burn the barn to kill the fly? I go. I said, I ain't the barn. <laughs> <laughs> and... When I was a kid, the, the thing about you do with a fly, you say, shoo fly, shoo. Get out of here. Yeah, amen. amen. <laughs> I go, ain't burning no bond. This bond is going to go on. Amen. Hallelujah. And then steal the pastor's time. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime he can. Amen. 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 Thank you. Give me that back. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. All right. I'm going to just go over some quick announcements. We're going to take up our offering and dismiss kids. What do you need? Yes. All right. Um, you know what? Yeah, kids, go. Yeah. They're squirming, and it's late. And they don't need to hear the announcements. Well... That's all right. Okay, so while they're uh, exiting the grand exodus, I'm um, just going to share with you a few things that are coming up. You probably saw a sign on the uh, door that says annual business meeting March 28th after church. So we'll be having that right after church. Um, I don't anticipate it being super long. We were going to try to do a fellowship dinner and... Um, and, and do a little bit more with that um, to try to get back in, but I don't think we're quite ready for that. Um, we'll give it another month and see if we can jump into fellowship dinners again. But um, So that'll be a short meeting, probably half an hour after church. And, um, and so if you're a member, make sure that you're here um, and because uh, we want you to be able to vote and uh, take a look at the budget and uh, hear about what we did last year and the, and the previous. So uh, a lot has happened and, um, and some good things um, amidst a year of absolute insanity. We managed to get some things done, so praise God. Um, so uh, on Bottling Club is Monday. Monday is a movie night, and that's here? Okay. At six o'clock, and that's for the teen girls. Um, let's see. Uh, we had an awesome men's breakfast and a really good women's conference. I heard last uh, yesterday, um, and so the next uh, men's breakfast and women's breakfast is going to be on April tw April seventeenth. If you want to put that in your calendar. Um, the Revive Youth Conference is April twenty second to the twenty fourth. See Jake or Kimmy for more details on that. Um, Emma's going to talk about what's happening with Bible Quiz next week. That's going to be at 4 o'clock. Do you want to still do that, even though most of the kids went downstairs? Yeah. All right.
right, so um, all of the kids went downstairs. I was gonna do something with them to kind of check in with them on studying, but I hope the parents are helping them study. That would be lovely. If Excellent. not, shame. Um, okay, so next Sunday at four o'clock, we are doing a Bible quiz meet. If you have a kid that's quizzing, or even if you just wanna come and watch, please do. We're gonna do it up here. We'll have some tables for the quizzers, and you can just sit anywhere you want and listen to the meet. It's really fun. Um, these kids learn so much, and it's so cool to watch them just hit the buzzer and rattle off verses and just like, it's so cool. It's really exciting. So we're gonna do that at four, four o'clock yeah. on Sunday. And I'll order pizza afterwards. So, and I'll order pizza afterwards. Oh, yeah. uh, all right. Now, oh yeah, I ordered pizza, now everybody's going to be here, I see. <laughs> All right, um, and I think that is about it for announcements. So we're going to take up our tithes and offerings. If you guys want to come, I'm going to pray over that, and then we'll get right into the Word, because time is flying by. All right, let's pray. Uh, Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you are here in the midst of us. We ask God that you would bless today. Father, that you would pour out your spirit upon your people. Uh, Father, as we get ready to get into the word and as we take up this offering, Father, we recognize that you provide everything. That you are our great provider. You are our provision. And so, Father, everything that we have belongs to you. And so at this time, God, we, we take up a, you know, an offering of praise and worship and our tithes, and we ask God that you would bless and meet every need within the congregation and within this community. We thank you for what you're going to do. We know that you're going to multiply it and bless it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So they're going to come wait upon you for that. And today we are going to get into Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to be looking, uh, starting in verse 12, this is our fourth message in the series where we're preaching through the book of Revelation, and uh, we're on the church of Pergamum. And uh, if you remember the church of Ephesus... When we, were re when we were looking at that, that was the church that had lost the love it had at first. Um, it was a church that had slipped into mediocrity and uh, lost its passion for the Lord. A church of routine rather than deep, intimate relationship. And um, the Lord reminded them that He is the God that sees them and is amongst them. And... Next, we talked about the church of Smyrna, um, and this was a church that was um, sold out even unto death for the Lord. They are the church of martyrs, if you will, and they were under heavy persecution. They were poor, and God declared that they were rich. And uh, uh, He comforted them, comforted them by reminding them that He was the is the God that was dead and is alive. And today we're going to look at that third church, and that's the church of Pergamum. And uh, this is the church of compromise. The church of compromise. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And it says, To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antip Ant Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some amongst you that hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. 
Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give him of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Lord Jesus, as we dig into Your Scriptures, we ask God that You would enlighten us. Father, that You would draw us close to You. Father God, we pray that as we read this, Lord, You would be our hidden manna. God, that You would be that bread of life in our life. And Father, we submit ourselves to Your Word. We submit ourselves to the authority of the Bible. We submit ourselves to the moving of the Holy Spirit. And we ask, Lord God, that You would transform us and make us more like You. We love You and we praise You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So, Can I tell you a secret? (laughs) My name is not Tony. (laughs) My name has never been Tony. I've been lying to you this whole time. My name's Anthony. And um, when I was a kid, uh, until I was about 12 years old, I went by Ant. A N T. Ant. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of ant, one of the things that I think of is this tiny, little insignificant creature. That is, um, th- there are billions and trillions of them in the world, all exactly alike, doing exactly the same thing, running the same course. Uh, with no real distinction between the two between two different ants. Now, I mean, yes, you have giant ants, and you have you know red ants, and you have fire ants, and you have those things, but they're all ants. They got the same jobs, and you can't tell two ants of the same species apart all that much. They're the same. And I went by this term, this. Uh, this kind of insignificant term for the first 12 years of my life. A lot of kids don't like their names when they get them. You know, I I was talking to a kid in youth group that has changed her name. And she hasn't really changed her name. She just wants somebody to call them something else. And most most kids go through that phase where they're like, I don't know, you know, Rose. You know, I don't want to be called Rose. But names are significant. Names are very, very significant. And God is in the business of giving out new names. Significant names to those that overcome. In the Scripture, He gave out a new name to Jacob after a wrestling match where Jacob overcame. He gave a new name to Abram after he overcame a long wait for God's promise. He gave a devout Jew named Saul a new name when he gave God his life and submitted himself completely to God. And the church in Pergamum, they they have a promise that a name will be written on a white stone. And that name no one will know except them. This new name is a a clean slate, a, a new leaf, a symbol of transformation that occurs. Can I tell you that God is in the business of second chances? That He is in the business of giving new names and clean slates. This is so important. It's the truth of the Gospel. 
That God is not interested in past performances. He is interested in giving you a new name and a new chance. This letter on face, if you look at it face value, it can be very hard. But it comes with some very good news. But the reality is there's not much in life that is easy that is worth doing. And Jesus is speaking to this church and He's asking for some change. And whenever Jesus speaks, we should pay attention. We should listen very carefully. And He's probably going to ask us to do something that is difficult, maybe even impossible for us to do on our own. But when God asks us to do something hard, it's always worth doing. Amen? My question for you this morning is, what tough thing is God calling you to this morning? I want to look at the pattern of this letter. In each of the letters, Jesus is announced differently. And um, it always has something to do with how He's going to interact with the churches. In Ephesus, He's the one who walks amongst the seven churches. In Samaria, He was the one who is dead and is now amongst the living. In Pergamum, Jesus is described this way. It says, These are the words of Him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. This is in reference to chapter 1, um, where John describes the Lord as having a sharp, double-edged sword coming out of His mouth. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a double-edged sword, but this is a double-edged sword. One of many different kinds. And it cuts both ways. Up and down. I promise I won't get too close. This is a good social distancing weapon. <laughs> it's not very sharp. This is a, an imitation sword. I, I actually bought it for my son for Christmas last year because he collects things like this. And, uh, but it's a really good illustration. You know, You have this ability to cut in two directions. And so when it talks about a double-edged sword, the Word of God coming out of His mouth as a double-edged sword, it is a sword that cuts many ways. I'm going to put this away before I hurt myself. I'm making people nervous. Might bring it out again later. We'll see. But in Hebrews... Chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. The Word of God is described as a double-edged sword. And I'm going to read it with uh, the NLT, the New Living Translation. Um, but I'm also going to like stop and insert words from the King James and from the NIV because they're all awesome. Uh, and I just couldn't pick one. All right? And uh, if you look up the meanings of the words, the, the words are so rich that all of them are accurate. Uh, they just take it from a different angle. And so verse 12 says this, For the Word of God is alive, or quick, or active, and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit, between the joint and the marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes. The King James says, Neither is there any creature that is not made manifest in His sight. And He is the One whom we are accountable to. So when we see this in Revelation 2, and he, um, he is the one with the two-edged sword, the following statement says, and I know where you live. That's actually kind of creepy if you think about it. Like, the one with the two-edged sword, and I know where you live. Seems like something from a bad horror movie. 
<laughs> um, but what's going on here is he's still saying, I see. I see. And I have this tool that cuts and divides and you're made manifest before me. Now, a manifest is an interesting word. It's a, it's a word that is used on ships and in planes, and it is a uh, list of what is inside. It's a list of what is inside. And so if a captain gets on a ship, he can take a look at the manifest. He knows everything that's on there. And a good captain will go and investigate and make sure that the manifest matches what's actually on board. And what they'll do is they check that because when they arrive in port or at the airport, the port authorities are going to check the manifest. And if they check the manifest and they say, oh, wow, you left with uh, 26 crates, but you arrived with 27 crates. Something's not right here. And they might go and decide to pour through and cut open boxes and make sure that you're not, you didn't pick something up on the way that isn't supposed to be there. And so the Word of God, or this two-edged sword that God uses, lays us manifest before Him where He can open us up and cut and divide and see every thought, every action, every motive. And He can separate those things and we are laid exposed before His eyes. This is an aspect of God that should perhaps make us a little uncomfortable. I don't know about you, but sometimes that makes me a little uncomfortable. To think that God can see not just what I did, but the motive behind it. You, know, you can do good things from the wrong motive, and it's still wrong. You can think things that you never follow through with. God sees it. It's an interesting thing. He is the one that sees and discern, discerns our actions, our motives, our thoughts. Mostly I don't have to worry about the deceptive nature of it because pretty much everything I think just spills out of my mouth. I can't seem to reel it in. <laughs> but it is all laid naked and exposed before the Lord. You see, the Scripture of the double-edged sword describes the way that God is able to see us like no one else in our lives. We're laid before Him. Our thoughts and our motives exposed and made manifest. So when Jesus announces Himself this way, we have to know that there's a problem. And that problem comes in the form of something other than outright rebellion, but in the form of compromise. The church of compromise is really the best definition of Pergamum. And uh, compromise is one of the most dangerous tools that the enemy will use in your life. It is one of the most dan dangerous things because compromise will allow things onto your manifest that should not be there. Let's look at the, some of the things that are mentioned. In verse 13, he says, I know where you live. Where Satan has his throne. And he mentions the city where Satan lives. And this is Pergamum. Now, normally, if someone says that um, you live where Satan has his throne, where Satan lives, 
our natural thought is maybe we should move. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's what I think when I think of that. I'm like, that's not where I want to hang out. All right? But actually, I don't think that that's necessarily where God is going with this. All right? And I want to be really clear about that. There's a missionary, famous missionary from around the turn of the 20th century named C.T. Studd. And uh, he was quoted, probably his most famous quote, and it says, Some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bells. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. And, and that should be the heart of the church, is that we are in the world, but not of the world. And this is a very fine line. To be in the world, but not of the world is very difficult because the tendency of when you are in the world is to want to compromise to be loved and accepted by the world. But Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. It's not, it doesn't work that way. The reason that God talks about this city the way that He does is because of the city's love for idolatry. They worshipped Zeus. Kimmy's got a picture. Uh, this is just one thing. And they had an altar uh, to Zeus that was found um, with Zeus the Savior inscribed on it. Can you show that one? They've actually found this a couple thousand years old. Um, and they've excavated it. And the worship of uh, Jupiter, the Greek god, was also a prominent figure of worship. Can you bring that one up? Pergamum had another distinction. It was the first city to allow, um, that was allowed to build a temple to the living emperor. Okay? And this is what's left of it. Uh, it was built in about 29 AD by Augustus. Um, and so it was kind of a center for pagan worship. It was everywhere. And for whatever reasons, things were, were spiritually worse there. Perhaps because the city um, had this distinction of uh, being one that was known for executing Christians. We know that the atmosphere can be worse in certain cities and certain countries. And even the atmosphere can be different day to night. Just the other day, I was talking to someone outside of my house, and uh, he was talking about Berlin and how much he loved Berlin. But he said, something happens when it gets dark here. It's, it's not, you don't feel good being outside. Something happens. And, and there's a, a sense that in certain places, Satan loves to operate. And this was one of those cities. He goes on to talk about um, these uh, different types of um, temples and, and stuff that are going on. But uh, what we know about these different idol worships or, or these different uh, temples is that there were sexual rituals and orgies that went on. All sorts of sexual immorality was promoted um, within the city because of it. And he goes on to talk about the teachings of Balaam. And... According to the Bible, uh, the Midianite were enticed to, uh, or they were asked to entice the men of Israel um, to get them to eat from the uh, sacrificed foods and to worship idols and, uh, and to commit sexual immorality. So you see in these cultures, those that, uh, that followed these teachings were also much like the... the uh, Nicolaitans. And it, this was all compromise to the church. You see, Satan is battling all the time to get our attention. He wants our attention off of the Lord and on other things. He's free on this earth to work and do. And, um, and he uses things like the occult and witchcraft and idolatry idol worship, worldly pleasure, to persuade us to compromise. Oh, that looks fun. Can't be that bad. And he uses this thing called peer pressure. 
And we see it a lot in high schools, but you know what? It happens all over in all sorts of different situations. Smyrna had these issues of persecution, just like Pergamon. But Smyrna called sin a sin. And, and Pergamon, they just kind of quietly let sin happen. And, and this was a dangerous place for Christians to fall into. When Christians stop calling sin, sin, they become that church. It's not that they didn't believe the truth, but they lost sight of the judgment of God's Word in their lives. There are great counterfeits to the Gospel, and we can find them in the occult, and in witchcraft, and in humanism, and in psychology. And the world is ever looking to integrate things into the church quietly and subtly. When Moses entered into the house of Pharaoh, there was a, he gave a sign to Pharaoh. He took his staff and he threw it on the ground and it became a snake. And this was supposed to show the power of God that was with him, that he represented the Lord. But what happened, a couple of the Pharaoh's magicians came and performed the same miracle. They threw their staffs on the ground and two snakes came out. Came out. But what happened? Moses' snake ate theirs. You see, it's a counterfeit. It's not as good, but it is appealing. And it's often easier. You see, there's always a counterfeit when God is trying to do something. What's going on here is Every time that God does something, the devil and the world try to show you that you could have the same pleasure or the same blessing or the same thing in another way. When I was a teenager, I was very interested in darkness. I mean, I think that's something that teens go through. Like, you just got to figure out what's on the other side. What's in that shadow. And there's really a tremendous amount of temptation in that. And... Uh, before I was saved, before I understood what it was, I used to use a, a, a Ouija board with some of my family. And it's a method of speaking to spirits or demons, if you will. And it was intriguing. It was so intriguing. And it would tell us things and it would speak into us. And it was dark. It was very interesting. Very appealing to be able to speak to something that you can't see. Very much a counterfeit of a relationship with a living God. What was interesting is after I got saved, I went back to that same house And I had a vibrant relationship with the Lord. And I had come to understand what that was. And I went back to that same house and my family, my uncles and my cousin, they were like, yeah, you know what, we're going to do this today. And I said, you know what, I, I can't do that. I can't do that because of my relationship with God. He says I shouldn't do that. I said, but you know what? You go ahead, I'm going to sit over here. And it was very interesting to see what happened as I sat over on the side and I prayed in the Spirit and with understanding. And I spoke the name of Jesus. That board became unintelligible and it would spin out of control. And the piece that you would put your hands on would slide off the board. And one time it even flipped off the table. You see, light and darkness cannot be in the same room. When the light comes on, the darkness flees. It becomes confused. And so there's power in that name of Jesus. It can't be in the same place. And so what's going on here is the church in Pergamum is doing this very, very dangerous thing. It's taking the ways of the world and bringing them into their lives. 
And it's contradicting the Word of God. You think this is dangerous. This is dangerous. This is sharp and able to divide more than just your flesh, but even your soul and your spirit. Cutting down, separating even your emotions, even your, your, your thoughts from your actions, your motives. Show me a knife that can do that. There's nothing more powerful than the Word of God. It's more powerful than any other. It's more powerful than any witch board or oracle or medium. You see, there is power in the Word of God. There's power in the name of Jesus to expose and to destroy that which the enemy creates to distract and to, ha- and to cause us to compromise. We must be uncompromising in these things. Pergamum was a city built on idol worship and witchcraft and, and, and sexual idolatry and temptation. And Satan always uses the pressures of the culture to try to integrate sin into the church. And this is where the church of Pergamum was. And he calls them out. First, he said what they did well. He said, they held fast to the name of Jesus. In verse 13, it says, I know your works where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name. And you did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas, who was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Antipas was... um, He was reported to be the bishop in the Christian church in Pergamos. And he was martyred for his faith because of his constant faithful witnessing in the face of the satanic evils that were present there. Antipas was advised at one time, he, it, it says that someone said to him, Antipas, the whole world is against you. And he replied, then I am against the whole world. According to tradition, um, Kimmy, if you want to show that next picture. Antipas was supposedly roasted alive in a hollowed out life-size bull with a bonfire under its belly because he refused to renounce his faith in Jesus Christ. He was so willing to go against the grain that he was willing to die for his faith. And Jesus praises them for holding fast to His name and not denying Jesus even when their bishop was killed. In the face of this great persecution and great fear, they held fast to the name of the Lord. And in that way, they were successful. They were blessed. And they lived in the midst of a culture culture that opposed them. We don't see anything quite like that in this day and age but we do have a culture that opposes us. They are being reminded that they are overcoming the world and not denying their faith, which is a sign that their faith in Jesus is strong. What's interesting about this church is that they could have such strong faith and be so wrong. You can believe all the right things and still have all the wrong things in your life. And this is the message to this church. You've let in things that shouldn't be in. This is the rebuke. Um, That they had become a church of compromise. A church that is in the world and of the world. And God does not want us to be that. What had happened is they had manipulated a gospel of grace. This unmerited favor. 
and the lifestyle practices that were explicitly forbidden by the Word of God. We live in a culture a lot like this. Anything goes today. Anything goes. People have the freedom to live any way they want and do whatever they want and be accepted as normal. And the church of, as a whole in our culture, we've done a good job of standing firm on truth. I think we've done a horrible job of conveying the love of Christ to those that sin sometimes. You see, the church has a reputation uh, in America of being against certain lifestyles. And honestly, that's not wrong. It's sin according to the Word. But it's the Word's job to divide it. It's the Word's job to fix it. It's the Word's job. Our job is to show them Jesus. To introduce them to Jesus. And let Jesus do the work. The church as a whole, and I'm not talking necessarily about this church. I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about the American church or the church of the world. What we've done is we've become the enemy of all these different groups. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. What we're supposed to be is we're supposed to be Jesus and show them the love of the Lord. Let them fall in love with Jesus and then let Jesus clean them up. Because Jesus will do it. The Word is sharp. It divides. It cuts that stuff out. If I try to do it, I'm going to kill the fish. You get what I'm saying? So many times church culture has tried to clean the fish before we even get them in the boat. And we need to get them in the boat, church. I'm sorry, I deviated. Now i got to find my place. We all struggle. And one of the things that you'll find is in those places where it talks about homosexuality or it talks about all these other things, it's in a list of like 10 different things or 15 different things. We need to talk about all other nine. A whole lot. Because I'll tell you, the gossip and the slander and the backbiting and all the other things that are incorporated, just as much sin. Just as much a problem. Where am I? So lost. Hopefully somebody needed to hear that. Where am I? Oh my goodness. Worshiping an idol or participating in some odd sexuality or, part or participating in any old activity in our culture is just fine. But we're under grace. And, and these uh, Nicola Nicolaitans, I always want to call them Nickelodeons, but I think that's because I grew up in that culture. <laughs> what, they, uh, what they would do is they would take the Gospel and this understanding of grace, this favor, and they would say, well, because Jesus washes away our sins, we can do whatever we want. That's not the Gospel. And in fact, there's two things that we have to do. We have to repent. That means turn away from a lifestyle of sin. And we have to believe. That's it. We have to repent and we have to believe. And this is what he tells them. He says, Repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and I will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. And you will see it is the Word of God that will be against us if we don't repent. God is not a man that He should lie. So if His Word says a certain thing, then He's obligated to uphold it. You see, the Word is a weapon. 
We have a tendency as humans to decide which sin is okay and which sin is not. They're all not okay. And there is no compromise in this. Now, what's interesting is I was thinking about this two-edged sword. I'm going to get this out because you guys look bored. (laughs) I'm just kidding. But we have this two-edged sword. And, And we often think about, okay, well, one sword does one job. Right? But if the word is a two-edged sword, it means that there's two sides to who God is. You see, there's a judgment edge. And there's a grace edge. The same sword that will judge will cut away that sinful part of your life. It will perform surgery on you to save you and give you grace. You have a judgment side that says these sins can't be part of your life. And a a grace side that says I'm going to pay the price. I'm going to cut it away. I'm going to pay the price. I'm going to die so that you can have life. And so this is the message that he's giving the church in Pergamum. And I think it's a message that we all need to apply to ourselves. There are going to be things from this world that are going to try to sneak in. And if we allow them in, we're going to be separated from the Lord. And God is calling us to a state of repentance of those things so that we can have right relationship with Him. I am all over my notes. I don't even know where I am. Oh, let's see. Grace is a funny word. I think we miss it up. I mean, we kind of mess up grace a lot. And we hear about it being God's favor, but it's really something that's a moving forward word. When we repent of our sins, let's say that that wall is destruction. Okay? And we're headed in destruction. We're walking. I'm gonna, am I going to get in front of something that's going to squeak? I hope not. But if we're headed in this direction and we have sin in our life, we're headed in rebellion. All right? We repent. We turn and we head towards glory. The grace that's applied here at repentance allows us to move forward beyond the sin. You see, the world will call you a liar forever, but Jesus will say you're forgiven, you're new, you're transformed, you're changed. This last verse. And I'll close with this. It says, Whoever has ears, let him hear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name on it, known only to the one who receives it. Kimmy, can you show us a stone? Hidden manna is the Word of God. Jesus at the well said that He ate bread that the disciples didn't know. It was the work and the Word. Jesus declared to the devil, man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word of God. So manna is the joy of obedience to the Word. And to him who overcomes, the one that is victorious, there will be a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. There's no way to really know what Jesus means by this stone. And honestly, I looked it up. There's probably like nine different interpretations of what this phrase means. 
But what is really interesting, and I think probably is the most widely respected point of view, is that when there was a a trial that went on, and someone was uh, on trial, say, for murder, um, or tax evasion, or whatever, the jurors in the trial would have two stones. They would have a black stone and they would have a white stone. And when they voted to acquit someone, they would give them a white stone. It was a stone of of acquittal, meaning the charge is no longer going to be held against you. And so this stone that he's talking about is a it's probably a stone of a casting of judgment that says, I've acquitted you because you've been victorious. You've held up against the onslaught of the culture. This is the grace. Now keeping in mind, this stone is given to a church that was in great sin. Why? Because of repentance. You see, we can't do whatever we want and expect the side of the sword that we want. We have to choose the side of grace, which is obedience. When I was 12 years old, I was ant. I was an insignificant person on an insignificant course. And I heard the Word of God and it cut me and it divided my soul and my spirit, my bone and my marrow. It pointed out the sin in my life. I heard the good news that Jesus died on a cross for me. It separated me from my sin. As far as the east is from the west, the Bible says. And I had a lot still struggle with sin from time to time. Am I alone in that? I don't think so. But I heard that good news. And it was almost immediately, this wasn't intentional, but it was almost immediately, almost everybody in my life started calling me Tony. They stopped calling me Aunt. They just started calling me Tony. And Tony means priceless. So God took something insignificant and He renamed it something priceless. And I'm going to tell you that God can do that for you today too. Because God is in the business of clean slates and new names. Amen? Let's pray and we'll close. If there's anybody here you don't know this Jesus, Maybe you're here and you've thought to yourself, you know what, I, uh, I've had some compromise in my life. Now might be a time to offer that up to the Lord. So Father, as we pray today, God, first, if there's any compromise within us, Lord, if we've allowed anything in from this world, Father, we lay that before You. God, we know that we're already made manifest. God, You see everything. And so, Father, we confess those things before You. And and God, we ask that, that You would use the Word ever so gently, ever so delicately. Apply the sword of grace into our lives. Cut that thing out in the name of Jesus. We repent, Lord, of those things. We ask, God, that You would apply forgiveness and grace and mercy, Father. We don't deserve it. But You are so good. Father, we don't want to take advantage of it, God. We want to turn away from it entirely. Help us to walk away from it, Lord, and not go back to it. And Father, if there's anybody here that they 
don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, if they don't understand this grace, I pray, Father, that they would come to know You. And I ask, God, that You would enter their heart and enter their lives. And, Father, that they would seek out wisdom from the sword of truth, from the Word of God. I just ask, God, that You would transform us, change us, and make us more like You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord, and you want to have that grace applied, or you need prayer, I'm here. But I'm going to let people go. It's getting late. Um, There is coffee in the lobby, so if you want to visit, I'd encourage you to do that out there. And, uh, you know, take advantage of the fact that the kids are downstairs and visit a little bit out there. Amen.